Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But we learn very quickly that that's not true, don't we? Sometimes the physical wounds that we receive heal a lot quicker than the things that are said to us, the things that hurt us. Verbal abuse is far too prevalent in our world and in our society today, and there is a growing concern and sensitivity to what people say to one another and how offensive it may be. Just this past week, two of the actors in the Avengers sequel that will come out this Friday were apologizing because they jokingly said during an interview that one of the characters of the film, not even a real person, Black Widow, they called her a slut. People were offended, and rightly so, and so they apologized for it. And we've seen how there is an effort to become more sensitive about the words that we use and even make some changes if they are necessary. Several years ago, St. John's College in Queens was concerned about the name of its mascot for its sporting teams. They were known as the St. John's Redmen. They were afraid that it was going to offend those Native Americans. We used to know them as Indians, right? And so they changed it to the St. John's Red Storm. And along those lines, there's that same growing concern and pressure that's being placed upon the NFL's Washington Redskins that they should change their name. We also know there's always great debate, especially as it surrounds the rap world, about the use of the N-word. For some people, it can never be uttered, but for others, it's a term of endearment. And I've also seen, as you know, we live in a house for the mentally disabled, but there's all sorts of discussion that goes around the word retarded. That word has been a medical and legal diagnosis and term used to help people understand what's going on. As a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago, we received a document from a lawyer concerning one of our residents that used the word mentally retarded 21 times in the document to talk about the condition of this individual. But the baggage that has been thrown onto that word in recent history has caused the desire to move away from the use of that word in common language and in common society. So that great comeback that we always had on the playground, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, seems to be more of a dream than a reality, doesn't it? And here we are again on the fourth Sunday of Easter. And every year, the fourth Sunday of Easter is known as Good Shepherd Sunday. It is one of the most beloved Sundays of all the church here, next to the big ones that we love to celebrate. Because it paints one of the most beautiful pictures of our God and our Creator. We sing or we say the 23rd Psalm that the Lord leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. We fear no evil. We talk about the Lord being our good shepherd who keeps watch over the sheep. It's what we prayed in our opening prayer today, that the Good Shepherd would heal us, guide us, lead us, and protect us. And we love when we hear the Gospels, especially John, record for us and offer for us a description of what it means for our Lord to be our Shepherd. He paints beautiful words saying to us today, the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. In a world where voices so often speak things that are hurtful and offensive, it's the voice of the good shepherd that offers comfort and offers peace. So powerful is this that we love our artwork with it. It's one of the most beloved pictures that churches and people have in their homes. As a matter of fact, this week I had all the kids from Lou Day in chapel at one point or another. I did five chapels for everyone from the two and three year olds all the way up to the fifth graders. And what I did is I took them up to the original church, the historic chapel, so that they could see the big Good Shepherd window that we have that lines Vernon Valley Wall, the road on the back walls. And that was our, our lesson for the day. I had them turn around and look at the window. And regardless of their age, those kids got the point. They saw Jesus standing in the middle of the sheep, carrying the two little lambs. And they were able to talk about what it meant for Jesus to be their shepherd. 
to get them when they're lost, to protect them, to carry them during difficult times. And so beautiful and so important is this picture for us. Because as Jesus himself proclaims in the words that he uses, we are surrounded by the hired hand and the wolves. I am always amazed at how the words that our Lord chooses in Scripture are so articulate and appropriate for what surrounds us and what we have to deal with in life. The hired hand. It's those people who care more about their own advancement and their own interests in life than the interests of others. We are so ingrained in our lives today to expect others to be trying to take advantage of us or to do something for themselves instead of us that we're shocked when we actually meet somebody who's concerned more about our well-being than their own. The hired hand, when the going gets tough, runs and scatters in order to protect their own hide instead of worrying about those to whom they're to lead or watch over and protect. And it amazes me how our Lord recognizes that and knows that this is our reality and our struggle as we live as the people of God. And we're surrounded by wolves. Wolves are those things that seek to devour us. The wolves lurk in the darkness, tempting us to go astray, to be scattered. It's the temptations, the evils, the things that tempt us to think that the journey of faith, that the gifts of our Creator aren't real, or they're not worth it, or they can't help us. And it's the voice of the wolves that so often speak those things that pierce our hearts, that offend our lives, that hurt us to the core. And so concerned is our Good Shepherd about the hired hand and the wolves and the dangers that surround us as his sheep, that he's willing to go to any length, even to giving his life to help us and to save us. I am the good shepherd. Words that paint an incredibly beautiful picture. And what we love about it is it's about a relationship. It's about our Lord knowing us, understanding us, and doing everything that our God can to help us. A seminarian, a student studying to be a pastor, was in his professor's class one day, and he said to the professor, Professor, I really love you. And the professor responded by saying, Okay, if you love me, tell me what pains me. After a few moments of stunned silence, the professor then said, See, love is more than just an affection or a feeling. Love is understanding and knowing what somebody's struggling with, what's hurting them, what their pains are. In a healthy relationship, in a marriage, a husband and wife understand each other's weakness, understand each other's anxieties and pains. And that's why the Good Shepherd is so healing and powerful for us. Our Lord knows us understands us, sees our pains and our struggles and our weaknesses, and helps us. That's the beauty and the comfort of these words. In the midst of a world where so many words are spoken because people don't know us and don't understand us, and when they speak what they say, it offends and hurts us, it's these words, I am the good shepherd, that always give us comfort. And always give us healing. 